Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm really very pleased to be here. Um, what I'm going to do is, is continue telling you about this um, really significant disease of rice, um, rice blast disease. And, and of course, as we've heard, um, it's also a significant threat to wheat production as well. What I'm going to do is, is, um, is try and tell you some work which is somewhat complementary to, to uh, the uh, studies that Barbara's talked about and tell you much more about the developmental biology of the fungus um, and something about the uh, underlying determinants um, of virulence. So how is this, this uh, fungus able to cause disease in, uh, in rice and, and indeed in wheat? Um, okay, so you can see the uh, typical leaf symptoms on, uh, on uh, these are on mature rice, uh, rice leaves. And I think the important thing to, to say is, is that this is, gives you an idea of, of how this disease can build such uh, enormous disease pressure um, uh, and, and, and reach epidemic proportions. These lesions are about uh, a centimeter or so in length, and, and each one of those lesions will produce somewhere between 20 and 50,000 spores every 24 hours. Sporulation is on a circadian rhythm, so this sporulation occurs at the dew point, uh, which is the, the ideal opportune time by which uh, transmission can occur. And you can imagine that they'll continue sporulating every 24 hours for, for several weeks. So you can have enormous inoculum buildup of the spores that transmit this fungus very, very quickly. But the, uh, the disease that, uh, the pathology that, that farmers fear the most is, uh, is this one, is, is neck blast. And as, as Barbara mentioned, when this spreads into the panicle or into the neck, uh, which, uh, which, which holds the inflorescence, the panicle which holds rice grain, you can get complete yield loss. And this um, picture was taken in Hunan province in China. Um, so I took this picture um, a, a, around 10 years ago now. Um, and I spoke to the farmer then. The farmer said that they had about 80 to 90% yield loss for that particular field. So you get absolute devastation when, uh, when you get neck and panicle blast symptoms occurring. Um, and of course, in, in wheat blast, the symptoms are, are again very different uh, it's a spike disease. It, it resembles um, diseases that other plant pathologists would be familiar with, things like Fusarium head blight. It actually looks like a, a very different type of pathology. So this fungus actually has the capacity to grow in very, very different tissue types. So it can grow in stem tissue, it can grow in, uh, in leaf tissue. We also know it can grow even in root tissue. Um, and it has an ancestral relationship to, uh, to root pathogens like Goimanomyces graminis, for instance. So it has the capacity to actually colonize many, many different parts of, uh, of plant tissue and indeed cause very different pathologies. Um, as Barbara mentioned, wheat blast is, is now a, a really significant threat to wheat production um, across South Asia because of its movement there um, in the last year. Um, and when a disease is sufficiently um, destructive that the only means of controlling it is to throw kerosene on the fields and set fire to it, you can see that this is actually a, a, an urgent problem um, and one which, which we in the, in the BLAST research community really have to, um, uh, have to take some responsibility for. And the next speaker, Sophie and Kamun, led um, the Open Wheat BLAST project by which a, a group of uh, BLAST researchers around the world really um, tried to, uh, to respond very, very quickly to this emerging threat in uh, um, uh, in, uh, in wheat blast, to this threat to wheat production. Okay, what I'm going to do though is tell you about uh, what we're trying to do to try and make sure our, our rice looks like this uh, rather than, uh, than looks in its disease state. And I'm going to tell you about three different things today. So first of all, I'm going to tell you about how the blast fungus actually infects rice plants. I'm going to tell you about the very early stages of infection, right at the, the start of the process. Um, then I'm going to tell you some new work about how the blast fungus is able to move between rice cells. And that's going to include an understanding or um, a, a development of some of the themes that Barbara talked about in terms of the ma manipulation of plasma desmata, those channels between plant cells. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some of our applied work. What we're trying to to do to control rice blast in the developing world and some of the work uh, we've been doing there. Okay, so how does uh, the blast fungus infect rice leaves? Well, the disease cycle starts when these three cell spores land on the surface of a rice leaf. They carry with them their own um, adhesive, their own attachment factor, which it, uh, is released upon hydration, sticks the spore very tightly to the hydrophobic waxy cuticle. And the spores will then uh, immediately germinate and they send out a polarized germ tube uh, which will then quickly differentiate within a, a small number of hours, within about four hours, into a dome-shaped cell called an apressorium. This apressorium is the infectious propagule, the infectious cell from which all the subsequent uh, fungal material will be derived. Uh, this single dome-shaped cell uh, which the fungus then uses to, to penetrate the, uh, the, the cuticle. 
And there are several, there are essentially three prerequisites for Apressoria to, uh, to form and then to function properly. And I'll tell you uh, briefly ab about those. The first thing is this has to be on the appropriate surface. It, it will only, Apressoria will only form on a hard hydrophobic surface. Um, and the fungus will respond to waxy uh, cuticle components from the, from the rice leaf surface. To do that, they utilize this signaling pathway, uh, or these two signaling pathways. Uh, first of all, there's a very conserved mitogen-activated protein kinase cascade, um, the PMK1 pathway. Um, and this responds to upstream uh, receptors. There's a cheap protein-coupled receptor, which can respond to ligands at the rice leaf surface. And there are also a series of stretch-activated gated ion channel proteins, which can respond to the hardness and hydrophobicity of the surface. Um, that will trigger morphogenesis. It triggers apressorium formation, such that if you delete that single MAP kinase, PMK1, uh, the fungus is no longer able to make an apressorium properly. At the same time, there's trafficking of the contents of, uh, of the, the spores into the apressorium and control of apressorium terga. And that is the responsibility of this pathway, the cyclic AMP response pathway. Uh, which actually leads to a number of those uh, changes, particularly in terms of uh, cellular storage products, things like lipid body movement and um, lipid body degradation and also glycogen uh, degradation and the, and the whole control of, um, of, of, of primary metabolism, which, uh, which, uh, which has to be radically changed during apressorium morphogenesis. The second thing that has to occur is that this is very tightly controlled to cell cycle control mechanisms. And you can see that illustrated here. This is a three-celled conidium. This nucleus here will divide in a moment. See, there it goes. Um, and the formation, the initial formation of that cell is uh, determined by a cell cycle control point, an S phase checkpoint. Then these nuclei left in the spore will start to degrade. That one goes first, followed by this one and this one. So cell cycle control is, is hugely important. That three nuclei to four nuclei to one nucleus pattern is completely invariant. Every time uh, there's an infection event, it always goes through that, uh, that chain of events. And there are a series of cell cycle checkpoints. There's an S phase checkpoint, a DNA replication checkpoint, uh, which determines the initial swelling of that cell. Uh, the apressorium uh, won't become fully differentiated until uh, that nucleus has actually passed through into, uh, or has passed from G2 into M, has actually un undergone uh, mitosis. And the mitotic exit is actually important for apressorium maturation to, uh, to occur. Indeed, there's a, there's a second S phase checkpoint that's really important subsequently for repolarization, as I'll, I'll tell you about later. So there's a series of cell cycle checkpoints control apressorial morphogenesis. And also, importantly, those three nuclei have to have been degraded in order for this cell then to be mature and competent to infect rice. And that process involves autophagy. Um, so here is a, a wild-type cell, and you can see the single nucleus in each of these apressoria. This is a, a mutant where we deleted um, one of the components of the, of the macroautophagy uh, pathway, ATG8, um, and you can see that the nuclei are no, no longer degraded. So they're, they're, they're distended and they're, uh, they're, uh, they're abnormal in, in shape, uh, but they're no longer uh, degraded. And um, what happens under those conditions is that the apressorium, although it forms, it is unable to mature properly and it's, un and it's unable to repolarize. So there has to be recycling of the contents of the spore, including uh, breakdown of the nuclear, as a prerequisite to make this apressorium functionally competent. And that's because this apressorium has to generate enormous terga. So it can generate terga of up to eight megapascals, so 80 bars of pressure, 40 times a car tire, so a, the, um, a, an extraordinary pressure for a living cell to generate. And it does that by accumulating solutes, polyols including glycerol, to extraordinarily high concentrations. That draws water in uh, by osmosis, and, that, uh, and the solute is prevented from leaving the cell because there's a thick melanin layer in the dome of the apressorium. So it's a combination of solute generation and melanization uh, which make that apressorium able to generate such enormous terga, which is then applied as physical force to puncture uh, the rice cuticle. And we know that the magnapulth is perfectly capable of breaking inert surfaces. It can break thin plastic layers, for instance. So it, it doesn't need to use um, enzymes to degrade the cuticle. It can do this using, uh, using physical force. Um, so the apressorium itself has to um, apply its... Uh, penetrative force at a single point at the base of the apressorium, the apressorium pore. Um, so that uh, 
leads to a whole variety of questions about how the fungus is able to change its axis of polarity um, and how it's able to, to, uh, to, to then gain entry to, to rice tissue. And some years ago, we started studying this process and we started to look at the reorientation of the actin cytoskeleton. What we found is that at the base of the apressorium, a toroidal ring structure of, uh, of, um, of filamentous actin is, is found. Um, and that's um, scaffolded and, and, and held in place basically by, the, by the formation of a septin ring. So septins are uh, GTPases, which form heterooligomeric structures. They're obviously well known to, maybe, to people here. Jeremy Thorne is in the audience, so lots of you will be familiar with septins. Um, so septins um, are, are pivotal to a whole variety of different morphogenetic processes um, in fungi and also in mammalian cells, for instance. Um, what septins are doing here is acting as a means of actually um, uh, developing cortical rigidity, but they act as a, uh, as a diffusion barrier for polarity determinants, uh, which are the means by which the apressorium is then able to, uh, to repolarize. And you can see that the septin ring, and this is an enormous septin ring, it's about uh, five uh, micro, uh, micrometers in, in diameter, um, it, uh, it, it, it co-localizes with uh, actin at the base of the apressorium. And this is the precise interface where the apressorium is in contact with the rice leaves. If we swing the, the microscope slide, you can see this is the interface, uh, the point at which the fungus is going to penetrate the underlying leaf tissue. If we delete any of the four core septins in, um, in, in Magnapultha, uh, then that filamentous actin toroidal structure can't form properly. You get this uh, tangled mess of actin, K, uh, uh, actin fibers, uh, but they're unable to form that ring structure at the base of the apressorium and organize the apressorium pore structure properly. Um, the septins are also responsible for the organization of a whole variety of other proteins. For instance, the eight-membered exorcist complex, which is required for polarized exocytosis, um, is also found in a, in a ring formation at the base of the apressorium, uh, and that's a septin-dependent process. They're, they're, they're held in place. Um, uh, they, uh, they're organized in a way which is dependent on the activity of the, the septins. So how then um, d does the apressorium um, perceive a signal to then repolarize. Uh, well, of course, one of the things that's occurring here is, is pressure generation. And we know that if we can, if we artificially lower pressure, which we can do by incubating apressorian hyperosmotic concentrations of glycerol, for instance, um, then this affects its ability to make uh, these septin rings. This is actually a septin ring SEP5. Um, and, and you can see in, in, the, in a control cell, we have uh, septin ring formation during a time course of apressorium development. But if we add hyperosmotic concentrations of glycerol, then the septin ring doesn't form properly um, and, unless, the, the, uh, and, unless the glycerol is at, added at a very late stage at which a commitment point has already been crossed. Or if we inhibit melanization, which will also affect the turga of cells, then again, that, that uh, has an effect on, um, on, on the organization of the septin ring. And, and all of the downstream subsequent events to that are, are determined by the cell having to have achieved a threshold of turga. And recently, we've identified a turga sensing kinase, uh, the SLN1 histidine aspartate kinase, uh, which seems to be important for the modulation of turga and therefore acts as a master regulator for these downstream processes which lead to repolarization of the apressorium. In an SLN1 mutant, which is non-pathogenic on, on rice, uh, if we measure the internal pressure of the cells, we can do that by incubating it in hyperosmotic concentrations of glycerol. Um, so uh, three molar glycerol would normally be sufficient to collapse uh, almost 90% of, of apressoria of the wild type cell. So, but an SLN1 mutant continually develops pressure. So it just develops pressure and pressure and pressure, but is never able to repolarize. Um, so it's never able to, to modulate that pressure and convert that or translate that into physical force in the reorientation of the cytoskeleton. And those regulatory processes are unable to occur in the absence of this SLN1 kinase. And that's enabled us to put together a model for how we think apressoria function. And this is a model that we're, we're, we're busy testing. In that, we have SLN1 as a, as a, 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 a turga sensing kinase. We know that it um, is tethered to the membrane, it's, um, and it's associated, it physically interacts with some stretch-activated gated ion channel proteins. Um, it also it acts upstream of the cell integrity uh, pathway in the protein kinase C pathway and acts as a means of modulating melanin biosynthesis and also the cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase A pathway. Um, it also is responsible for activation of the NADPH oxidase complex 
uh, which leads to a reactive oxygen species burst in the apressorium, um, and, uh, and, and that in turn affects uh, the regulation of, uh, of some polarity regulators such as CDC42 and RAC1. Um, and also the modulation of Terga involves regulation of the glycerol efflux pump, the F FPS1 uh, glycerol efflux pump, by which uh, means Terga is being modulated. That leads to a series of events uh, which, which ultimately um, will lead to, for example, the septin ring formation, the remodeling of actin, uh, chitin and glucan synthase activity as the penetration peg is developed, and then uh, targeted exocytosis at the pore, and then some uh, endocytosis, obviously, to, to, uh, so we achieve uh, sort of membrane homeostasis at that point. Um, this is also subject to a cell cycle control point, only if that nucleus is passed from the S phase into G2 will the apressorium be functionally competent, and that ultimately is what leads to peg formation. So we're beginning to have an idea about the way apressoria function, and we have a number of leads by which we can actually test uh, whether some of these assumptions are correct, uh, which is work with the, where, uh, that, that's ongoing in my group. So what happens next then? So this is the, we've been on the, the rice leaf surface. What's the, the next stage? What actually happens uh, subsequent to that? How does the fungus move between rice cells? What happens once it's actually in, uh, in the rice leaf? And you've seen some of the, uh, the morphogenetic changes that occur once the fungus is in the rice leaf from Barbara's talk. Um, and as it's uh, now entering this point and, and moving into primary invasive hyphae and then colonizing tissue rapidly. Um, so we can see here's an apressorium. If we lift the, uh, the, the, uh, the rice tissue, you can see there's the penetration peg, uh, which is entering, uh, entering the underlying uh, epidermal cell. Um, and those invasive hyphae actually change in terms of their shape. They become bulbous branch cells. They actually now undertake a sort of pseudo hyphal type of growth. Uh, they actually grow with a budding type of phenotype rather than, rather than classical filamentous hyphae, which we see when we grow the fungus in culture. Um, and as Barbara mentioned, they're, they're bounded by a tight uh, uh, apposition to the, to the plant plasma membrane. So there's a sealed hyphal uh, membrane compartment around the, the hypha. And in this case, we're looking at a rice transgenic plant where we've got a, um, a GFP labeled uh, plant plasma membrane protein. And you can see the, the, the rice plasma membrane tightly uh, uh, bound around this invasive hypha, which is uh, expressing cytoplasmic uh, red fluorescent protein. Um, and remarkably, as the fungus moves from cell to cell, it's able to maintain membrane integrity into the cells into which it's moving. So as it vacates cells, so if you've got these initial cell that has been invaded by, uh, by Magnaportha, very often we lose the integrity of the membrane that's around those hyphae, and eventually those cells will lose viability, and that's where you begin to see the beginning of the necrotic lesions, the symptom development of, uh, of rice blast. But it's continually moving in a biotrophic way. It's moving into living plant tissue, and as it moves into adjacent cells, it's always bounded by plant plasma membranes. So it's maintaining the integrity of the cells that it moves into. Uh, and the way it's able to do that is by manipulating plasma desmata and moving through pit fields uh, to enable it to actually maintain that mem membrane integrity of the cells into which it moves. As Barbara mentioned, there are two different types of effectors, effectors which are in the apoplast, like this green effector BAS4, which she, she mentioned. Um, which is uh, secreted from hyphal tips into the space between the fungal cell wall and the, and the plant plasma membrane. And then there are cytoplasmic effectors which are released through this uh, BIC structure, this biotrophic interfacial complex, and their destination is in, uh, in the cytoplasm or in different organelles within, uh, within uh, rice leaf cells. So how then is the fungus able to regulate some of these processes? Um, and in particular, how is it able to regulate its ability to move from one rice cell to the next rice cell? Well, to study that, we need to, uh, to, to reintroduce you to, to this uh, signaling pathway, which we spoke about at the beginning of the talk when I was talking about apressorium morphogenesis. So the PMK1 map kinase we know is absolutely essential for pathogenesis of the fungus. Um, but if we just knock this gene out, if we delete it, then we don't see an apressorium. There's, uh, there's no apressorium formation. But I remembered that when, uh, whenever you infect a wounded plant with, a, um, uh, with the PMK1 mutant, or indeed if you inject spores into, into living tissue, this mutant is never able to cause disease, at any, seemingly at any stage. So we wondered whether it actually played roles later on during infection. So we wanted to make a conditional mutant of PMK1 to try and address that. And the way we did that was to make a, an analog sensitive protein kinase um, uh, mutant in Magnaportha. Uh, so we made a point mutation in the gatekeeper residue uh, of the ATP binding pocket of PMK1, 
We introduced that allele back into a PMK1 deletion mutant, and it complements all the mutant phenotypes, uh, as, as you'd expect. Uh, but that point mutation is able to make that kinase sensitive to this naphthal PP1 molecule, um, and, um, and therefore provides you with a tool by which you can conditionally inactivate the kinase by adding a, an inhibitor, which will only affect a single MAP kinase. And to check that that worked properly, uh, we can see here's the, the, uh, the complemented strain. So the pmk one as is able to make an apressorium normally in the absence of an inhibitor. But if we add an inhibitor, naphthal PP1, uh, then its ability to make an apressorium is, is, is gone. But that means we can now do the experiment which we wanted to do originally, which is to inactivate the kinase after infection. Find out what will happen if we inactivate this protein kinase once the fungus is in living plant tissue. Well, what happens normally um, when we infect uh, tissue, this is the PMK1 AS strain, but with no inhibitor. So this is what would happen if a wild type cell infects the cells. You can see it fills the epidermal cell. And as soon as it reaches a sort of threshold of, uh, of hyphae, it then breaks out, undergoes hyphoconstriction, breaks out into the adjacent cells. It actually becomes more polarized as it's doing so, and it breaks out into the adjacent tissue. And this is how Magnaporter is able to move from one cell to another. And you'll see at the point at which it moves, there are hyphal constrictions as it locates pit field sites, which are clusters of plasma desmata, and then moves through those into adjacent cells. So this is what happens with the uh, PMK1 AS mutant, but in the absence of an inhibitor, so where the kinase is working normally. So if we add the inhibitor, um, the fungus is growing normally, and it will fill this epidermal cell, and it will carry on filling this epidermal cell, but it will never escape from it. And it's unable to move out of that cell at all and into the adjacent cells. So it will fill uh, the epidermal cell, but it's trapped and is unable to move uh, into the adjacent cell. And you can see that in this micrograph. It's, uh, it will fill this epidermal cell. This is an apressorium out of focus on the leaf surface. This is the, epi the first epidermal cell, but it's unable to move uh, into any of the adjacent cells around it. By doing that, by becoming trapped at that point, the plant is then able to respond, and the plant will launch a defense response. And you can see that uh, this is a reactive oxygen species burst uh, where we've, we've, sta we've stained with, uh, dio, uh, with, uh, with DAB staining. So uh, we've, uh, we've been able to, uh, to identify a reactive oxygen species burst, a plant defense response, as a consequence of the fungus not being able to, uh, to, to, uh, to be able to, to progress into, uh, into rice tissue. So what is PMK1 regulating during those processes? Well, well we carried out an RNA-seq experiment, and what we found is that, that this pathway is regulating a whole variety of different fungal gene functions, including a raft of effector proteins. Uh, so about 59 uh, temporally co-regulated effector-like uh, genes which are uh, regulated um, and uh, or down, severely down-regulated in the absence of the, or when we inhibit the protein kinase with naphthal PP1. And many of these are known effectors. Uh, and what these effectors are doing is actually suppressing plant defense. So clearly, this pathway is responsible for suppressing plant defense uh, responses, and particularly those at plasma desmata. And we know, for example, the callus deposition and a number of other things are, are being affected by, uh, by the absence of this PMK1 kinase. <laughs> But in addition, there are a, number of, a large number of other fungal proteins which are being affected. And many of these are involved in cellular morphogenesis. They're involved in actin remodeling. They're involved in, uh, in, in the repolarization pathways. They're, they're involved in the regulation of, of hyphal constriction. And you can see that process perhaps more vividly. In this movie, you can see that the fungus is actually undergoing a, a, a swelling at the point at the junction. And then it will squeeze through a, this narrower gap um, and then move through the other side. And this is an actin binding protein gel cell in GFP. So we can actually see a, a, an accumulation of filamentous actin at that point, at the point of hyphal constriction. Um, and also we have evidence that this is actually another septin-mediated response. There are septin collars which by, bound the, those, uh, those hyphal constrictions. Um, and, uh, and, and, and septin mutants appear to be uh, affected rather, uh, rather severely in their ability to actually move cell, from cell to cell uh, when we actually look at the uh, conditional mutants. So what you can see in, in terms of Magnapolta of moving from plant cell to plant cell is some processes which are somewhat analogous to the processes which occurred here during the early events of infection. Um, the fungus is uh, through this uh, 
MAP kinase cascade is able to regulate effector gene expression to suppress host defenses, particularly at cell junctions at plasma desmata, but also undergo cytoskeletal remodeling uh, in order to generate a septin collar and, uh, and hyphal constriction, actin-mediated hyphal constriction, um, in order for it to, uh, to move through pit field sites and, uh, and colonize the adjacent uh, tissue. So you, what I hope that illustrates is the fact that Magna Porta has to undergo some, some really very elaborate morphogenesis and a highly orchestrated infection process from the very start through its whole infection cycle um, uh, right the way through to symptom development. Okay, so finally then, I just want to tell you about some of the work we're trying to do uh, to, to do something more practical and actually try and control this disease in, um, in the developing world. And I'm going to tell you about a project which... Uh, I've been taking part in with a, a, a large number of collaborators uh, from uh, two US universities, Ohio State and, and Arkansas, and also a number of institutes across, um, across Africa, um, in Burkina Faso, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Nairobi, through Becca Ilri and, uh, and Caro, um, and, uh, and also at the International Rice Research Institute in, uh, in the Philippines. And we've been trying to undertake a project by which we can guide plant breeding strategies for the, for the control of rice blast. Rice blast is a hugely important problem in Africa. Um, rice um, consumption has increased dramatically, particularly in East Africa. Rice has always been uh, eaten uh, in West Africa for a, a much longer period of time. Rice cultivation has a longer history there. Uh, but rice consumption is increasing by about 12 to 15 percent per annum in, in Kenya um, and in Tanzania. Um, and it's, it's one of the most popular um, food products. Uh, but that leads to uh, importation of rice because rice production um, is insufficient to actually deal with, uh, with, with demand. Um, and newly developed cultivars of rice, which are interspecific hybrids between Ariza glabrima, African rice, and Ariza sativa, um, the, the conventional so Asiatic rice, um, lead to high yielding, locally adapted, somewhat drought tolerant rice cultivars, um, but they are incredibly susceptible to rice blast disease. So rice blast disease is actually the biggest single constraint on rice production um, now uh, uh, really across the African, uh, su across the sub-Saharan uh, African region. So what have we been doing? Well, Barbara talked about these avirulence gene pro, uh, genes, which, are, uh, which encode effectors. So as, as you've heard, effectors are involved in the suppression of plant immunity. Uh, but sometimes those effectors can be recognized by immune receptors, which are the products of major disease resistance genes in plants. Um, and, and by understanding the population structure, we can learn something about the, the resistance genes which would be necessary to control the prevailing population of the fungus. Um, so you can see, for instance, this uh, rice blast isolate um, is able to cause disease on um, a, 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 a rice cultivar with resistance gene PI50, but unable to cause disease on PI2 and PI9 and PIZT, which means it must have the corresponding avirulence genes, uh, the effectors which are, which are identified or recognized by that immune receptor. And you'll hear more about the molecular mechanisms of this in the, in the next talk. But if we can understand the prevailing rice blast population, it should tell us something about uh, the types of resistance genes which could provide durable resistance in, um, in, in Africa. So what have we done? Uh, well, what we've done is we've collected um, around 1,000 rice blast isolates from um, a whole raft of different countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, right the way across, uh, across Africa. Um, and we've genotyped all of those. Uh, we've actually sequenced a, a significant number of them as well. Um, and we've pathotyped all of them against the international uh, differential set, which is a near isogenic uh, series of rice differing by uh, each of, um, by around 30 different um, disease resistance genes. And we've, in that way, worked out the prevailing AVR genes that are present in the population. This gives you a type of uh, data output we get. Uh, so you can see red would be um, disease and green will be resistance. So you can see that there are uh, small numbers of, um, of cultivars which are, which are able to be resistant against a large number of different rice, um, uh, rice blast isolates 
from Africa. But if we put together that data across all 1,000 isolates, and we're collecting every year, we collect around three to 400 isolates per year, with the GPS tagged. Uh, we have a collection point in a biobank in Nairobi, uh, which stores all of those isolates. Um, and then we, uh, we back up those store, storages in, in Arkansas and in Exeter. Um, and, uh, and we have an ongoing disease surveillance process, um, in, uh, particularly in Kenya, Tanzania, and Burkina Faso, um, which, uh, which, is, which is ongoing and, and happens on an annual basis. Um, but what we can show so far is that there are a group of, um, of race-specific R genes, uh, PI5, PISH, PI2, PI1, uh, PI9, and PIB, uh, which will exclude the overwhelming majority of the prevailing African rice blast population. Um, however, none of them singly would be very durable because the fungus is able to overcome uh, disease resistance so easily by mutation of, of these uh, effectors, these AVR genes. Um, so we have a process which, by which we have ongoing pathogen surveillance um, we're deploying those race-specific resistance genes, but at the same time, we're introducing those in combination with non-race-specific R genes. So QTLs for rice blast tolerance, uh, a susceptible resistance gene, a, a, a dominant susceptibility factor, uh, which works by a different mechanism, um, and, and a number of, 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 um, of different types of resistant loci which are not non-race-specific. And what we're trying to do is, is put together a combination of race-independent and, and race-specific R genes um, and in order to, uh, to, to produce a, a stack of three to four dominant R genes in combination with QTLs and, and a susceptible um, R gene as well in, and, and do this in commercial, in widely grown um, rice blast varieties. Um, the way this process looks in the field, this is the type of work that we're doing on an ongoing basis, particularly this is carried out, this is work in the Philippines at IRI, um, but also mirrored, um, we're doing similar work in Burkina Faso, uh, where we're testing uh, QTLs for resistance compared to a susceptible line, uh, and, and this shows some of our crossing populations. But to tell you about the, the work that we're actually doing in, in both West Africa and East Africa, uh, so in, in West Africa, we're, we're working on the most widely grown rice variety, Basmati 370, two Nerica lines. These are the interspecific hybrid lines, which are very susceptible. Um, we're testing a, a variety of different uh, resistance genes, which have come through our pathogen surveillance system. Uh, we're then introducing those through marker-assisted breeding uh, into these East African rice lines and also working with scientists at the Cote d'Ivoire in Africa rice. We're introducing them into these two popular West African varieties of rice. Uh, so we've started with PI9, but we're stacking two other resistance genes and then, and, and then the QTL and a, and a, um, a, a recessive um, resistance gene as well. Um, so the process on an ongoing basis will look like this. At the moment, we're at the point where we're actually carrying out blast hotspot testing uh, with some of the cultivars that we've already generated. We already have our first uh, cultivar, which, is, uh, which has got a subset of those genes already in, in place. That's being tested in blast hotspots. They're in nine different countries across Africa, 24 different sites, uh, from Mali in the north to Madagascar in the south. Um, and, uh, and we test those in those blast hotspots to see the durability of the cultivars that we've identified. Uh, we then do greenhouse assessments. Those are done in my lab and also in, uh, um, in Arkansas and Ohio State. Uh, we have an ongoing process by which we're also looking for new resistance specificities uh, and then laboratory diagnosis to, to, uh, to confirm the prevalence of known AVR genes within that population. And in that way, our aim is over the next three to four years, we hope that we'll be in a position to actually release and go through product registration. The project registration, we hope, will actually cultivar registration would happen as, as early as the beginning of, of next year. Um, and, uh, and then those uh, will be uh, released to, uh, to growers throughout that region. And this is work which is funded by the Berlin Melinda Gates Foundation and, uh, and, and BBSRC, um, our research council. Okay, so, uh, so just to summarize the things I've told you about, so what I hope that you've learned from the first part of the talk, the developmental aspects of the work, is that Magnapothera's uh, infection is a highly orchestrated and regulated process. 
strongly linked to cell cycle control and to, uh, and to the operation of specific uh, signaling pathways uh, which are able to perceive the external environment. Um, rice tissue invasion similarly works in, in, in the same sort of way where you've got to regulate morphogenesis at the same time as regulating the suppression of host defenses. Uh, and finally, we're developing this durable control strategy to try and uh, alleviate some of the problems that rice blast is causing in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the, the work was uh, done by uh, a, a, a large number of people in my lab. I won't go through all of them, but Lauren Ryder in particular was very important in, in all of the work you've heard today on the Turga sensor, Wassin on the cell-to-cell -cell movement, Wassin Sokulko, um, and, uh, and, and, and Mick Kershaw and a number of others in terms of the applied work. Um, collaborators, are, well, both of the speakers, Sofian and, and Barbara, are major collaborators, um, in addition to uh, a, a number of our collaborators, particularly in that big um, African uh, project. My lab is currently the University of Exeter, but I'm very excited to be moving shortly to the Sainsbury Laboratory um, to, uh, to take on some new challenges, which is going to be great fun. Um, so, and uh, we'll answer questions at the end of uh, the session. Thanks. Thanks.